You've probably heard of Rare, the famous British game developer responsible for endless classics including Donkey Kong Country, Banjo-Kazooie, GoldenEye 007, Killer Instinct, Battletoads, and the list goes on. Rare are most famous for their time spent working with Nintendo as a second party developer and were seen by many as a sort of golden goose Nintendo would be fools to part with. After Nintendo parted with the developer in 2002 by selling their shares in the company to Microsoft, Rare has struggled to find a good foothold on the Xbox platform and they've fallen into relative obscurity compared to their Nintendo days. Today, Rare feels like a completely different company from the one I grew up with, so I want to tell you all about the games Rare used to make, starting from the beginning, before their time as a Nintendo developer, and before they were even known by the name Rare. Welcome to Rare Retrospective, a series where I explore the catalog of classics and flops released by Rare throughout their 40 year history. Today we're going to be talking about how the developer got their start releasing ZX Spectrum games under the label Ultimate Play the Game, and if you're interested in seeing where else the series takes us, make sure you subscribe to the channel. In the early 1980s, the brothers who would go on to found Rare, Tim and Chris Stamper, entered the games industry by working on arcade games with a company called Xilek Electronics. In their time doing arcade work, they developed at least a dozen different games and started their own development company, Ashby Computers and Graphics Limited. ACG did release a few arcade games of their own, but their primary focus was on home computer games with a particular focus on the ZX Spectrum where they released games under the label Ultimate Play the Game. Today we're here to discuss their Spectrum releases, but if you're interested in learning about the arcade games the Stamper Brothers worked on, let me know in the comments and I may make a video about them in the future. Ultimate was an incredibly highly acclaimed developer for the Spectrum, known for pushing the hardware to its limits and releasing visually stunning, incredibly creative, high quality games. If you look through the ZX Spectrum's catalog, you'll find dozens of clones of Ultimate games released by other companies. But depending on where you're from, you may have never even heard of the ZX Spectrum, let alone Ultimate Play the Game. The ZX Spectrum is an 8-bit home computer that was released in 1982 by British company Sinclair Research and it's considered one of the most influential home computers of its era. However, the Spectrum struggled to take off in many markets if it even reached them in the first place, and it's a relatively obscure piece of hardware in large parts of the world as a result. The ZX Spectrum is a simple piece of hardware by today's standards. Aside from black, white, and gray, it could only display six colors in two shades each. Its audio capabilities were even more limited, with only a single sound channel capable of producing beeps of various pitches and lengths. These beeps also took a lot of processing power to produce, which resulted in many games for the platform having rudimentary sound effects and no other in-game audio. Title screen jingles were fairly common, but most of them will make you wish you never had ears to begin with. There's a lot more we could talk about with the ZX Spectrum, like the terrible keyboard or the fact that most of its software was sold on audio cassette tapes, but I'm not here to talk about the hardware, I'm here to talk about the game's ultimate released for it. Unfortunately, Ultimate's catalog of games is fairly difficult to access in the modern day. The 2015 Xbox One release Rare Replay features seven of them in an easily accessible format, but the rest are hard to find outside of the UK, and their age means any tapes you do get your hands on may have already begun to degrade. I did check out every game they released on the Spectrum, and I will talk about them all, but I played the games included in Rare Replay much more extensively than the others, and I can offer more detailed opinions on them. Ultimate began their work on the Spectrum releasing simple titles with arcade-style gameplay, starting with the iconic 1983 release, Jetpack. If you weren't a British kid in the 80s, Jetpack is the ultimate game you're most likely to have played before or at least heard of. Since it's the developer's first proper release, Rare likes to make references to Jetpack often, such as when they infamously included it as a mandatory minigame in Donkey Kong 64, frustrating countless children around the world. There was also a 2007 remake released for the Xbox Live Arcade titled Jetpack Refueled. Jetpack is a simple one-screen game whose objective is to construct and fuel spaceships to fly between various planets collecting point items in the form of ore and minerals and fighting off alien enemies with a new ship to build every four levels. Jetman can fly around with his jetpack, fire lasers, and pick up items by touching them. The ship pieces and fuel need to be manually delivered back to the base of the ship with them automatically dropping down if you fly over it. The entire game takes place on this one screen with cycling enemies and ship designs, and it loops infinitely through its stages until you get a game over. 
Chipback is a very simple game that could easily fit into any 80s arcade, and I think its simplicity has caused it to age better than any of Ultimate's other Spectrum releases. The gameplay loop is easy to grasp and satisfying to improve at, and the game could easily stand beside classics like Donkey Kong and Galaga. If you only play one of Ultimate Spectrum games, you can't go wrong with Jetpack. After the critical and commercial success of Jetpack, Ultimate created a few more simple one-screen games. They followed Jetpack up with Cookie, a game where you play as a chef and need to use flower-based projectiles to push enemies into a mixing bowl while keeping garbage out. I found aiming my shots to actually push the correct things into the bowl pretty frustrating though, and I bounced off it pretty quickly. Following Cookie, they tried to increase the complexity a little with Psst. In Psst, you're a gardening robot who needs to use pesticides to protect a growing flower from various insects. The trick is that there are three separate cans, and each insect is only vulnerable to one of the three. So you need to go to and from the shelves on the sides of the screen to swap your pesticides to suit the situation. I really enjoyed the concept of this game, and I like that it requires you to change your weapons, but going back and forth to the shelves started to get tiresome pretty quickly. While I don't think Psst holds up as well as Jetpack, I do appreciate it as an attempt to increase gameplay complexity. Continuing to increase the complexity of their games, the next Ultimate release was Trans Am, a post-apocalyptic open-world car game featuring a day-night cycle. The game takes place in the year 3472, and your goal is to traverse and explore the continental United States in search of the eight great cups of Ultimate. Trans Am was a 1983 release though, so this amounts to driving across a plain yellow screen with little black dots to create an illusion of movement. When it's nighttime, it's a black screen with white dots. The cups spawn randomly around the map, and you need to find them all while periodically stopping at fuel stations to refill your gas tank. There are also enemy cars that will try to crash into you, which can be tracked with the radar on the side of the screen. This game is not fun at all, but it is ambitious in a way I can appreciate. The UI has a lot going on for the time, with a radar, map, speedometer, fuel gauge, and there's even a temperature gauge that fills up and overheats if you run your engine for too long. At the end of the day though, you're just driving across an empty yellow wasteland occupied by enemies that gun for you and are not subject to the same overheating engine that you are. Trans Am isn't very fun, but it's another clear step forward in game complexity, something Ultimate and later Rare characteristically pursued throughout their full history. The previous three games are hard to access in the modern day, as none of them made the Rare replay cut, but our next game did. It's a direct sequel to Jetpack, Lunar Jetman. Lunar Jetman is another game you might see in an arcade, but it's a dramatic step forward in intricacy from its predecessor, Jetpack. Lunar Jetman is the first game by Ultimate developed for the 48k version of the ZX Spectrum, as opposed to the 16k version the previous games were developed for, with the extra memory allowing for a much more complex game. The game takes place on a large, scrolling environment, and the player's objective is to transport a bomb from the starting point to an alien base which spawns at a random location on the map. Once a base is destroyed, a new bomb and a new base will both spawn. To facilitate the bomb transport, you've also been given a lunar rover with a cargo area that can be loaded with the bomb or other items. While inside the rover, Jetman is invincible to regular enemies, but it cannot travel across potholes in the road, requiring you to get out and cover them with bridges, which the rover has an infinite supply of. Jetman also now has limited fuel for his jetpack, which can be refueled at the rover. As you can probably tell, the rover is extremely important, more so than even Jetman himself. I say this because the game also features a timer across the top of the screen. Once the timer runs out, a missile will be launched at the rover from the alien base. If you don't intercept this missile by either shooting it down with Jetman's laser gun or throwing your body in front of it to take the shot yourself, the rover will explode and it will be an immediate game over no matter how many extra lives you still have. The rover will also explode if you drive it directly into an alien base. Another major mechanic of Lunar Jetman is the fact that Jetman's body explodes upon death, leaving behind craters that then must be patched over before the rover can cross them. This is very frustrating, and is actually made even more frustrating if you're using an Infinite Lives cheat code, like the one included in Rare Replay. Having infinite lives means there's nothing stopping you from piling up hole after hole after hole, dying and making more holes every time you go to patch one. The game becomes a Sisyphean exercise in patience as you get stuck in an endless loop of fixing your mistakes and making new ones in the process of fixing the old ones, just like in real life. But without infinite lives, you just get a game over and have to start over from the beginning, so that's not really much better. Aside from these core game mechanics, there's also two items you can interact with aside from the bombs and bridge pieces. 
There's a turret you can mount to the rover that's mostly pointless, as it prevents you from carrying the bomb and you don't get extra lives for killing basic enemies, only for destroying bases or stopping missiles, which I have not had luck trying to shoot down using the turret. The other item you can carry with you is a teleportation chamber, of which there are two on the map. As you might expect, entering one brings you out of the other, and you can travel through them while carrying items such as the bomb, allowing for much more efficient transit. This one's a lot more useful than the turret, but it's risky to use if you're not aware of what's on the other side, as you'll sometimes find yourself teleporting directly into your own demise. Lunar Jetman is a very interesting game with a lot of mechanics that mostly work pretty well. It's really dragged down by the sheer quantity of enemies, though. Sometimes it feels like you're in a bullet hell game with the amount of enemies the game just throws at you non-stop. With the enemy spam toned back, I could see myself actually enjoying this game, but the game they actually released is just frustrating and kind of miserable to play whether you're cheating or not. But even if I don't enjoy the game, I once again appreciate its ambition. It tried a lot of new things Ultimate hadn't experimented with before, and it's definitely a cool game you can get some enjoyment out of. Carrying the bomb through the teleporter and charging a base with it felt pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. After the release of Lunar Jetman, Ultimate started to release even more ambitious games, each one more complex and involved than the last, with goals and endings rather than just being simple endless arcade experiences like their previous games were, with the exception of Trans Am. We're entering the era of maze exploration games. Ultimate's next release after Lunar Jetman was Attic Attack, also featured in Rare Replay. Attic Attack is a top-down exploration game which puts you in a haunted mansion with two floors, an attic, a basement, and a series of underground caverns. Your goal is to locate the three pieces of the Golden Key of ACG to open the front door and escape. To start the game, you first pick one of three playable characters. There's a knight, a wizard, and a serf. They play slightly differently from each other, but the main reason to pick one character over the other is the fact that each one can traverse different secret passages from the other two, allowing each character to bypass different sections of the map than the others. As you explore, your health, represented by an enormous picture of a roast chicken, constantly drains and needs to be filled back up by collecting food. Touching enemies will of course remove a big chunk from your chicken. You'll regularly encounter doors that open and shut on their own, locking you in rooms with enemies or just wasting your time and by extension your health while you wait for them to open again. It's very annoying. You'll also find color-coded locked gates which can only be opened with corresponding small keys, as well as special tools which can defeat otherwise unstoppable enemies such as across the Scareway Dracula or a spanner to defeat Frankenstein's monster somehow. I guess you pull out the bolts in his neck. There are also red herring items that serve no purpose other than to waste inventory slots, which are precious as you only have three of them. Inventory management is a central mechanic in Attic Attack, as there are four colored keys, three golden key pieces, three unique monsters which require different tools to defeat, and only three inventory slots to work with. Whenever you find an item you need, you need to put something down and remember where you left it, just in case you need to come back later. At the end of the game, you need to place all the key pieces in your inventory together in the correct order to exit through the front door. Congratulations! You have escaped! Funny story, Rare Replay actually features a cheat for Attic Attack called Revised Ending, and the only thing it does is fix that typo. I honestly love Attic Attack. I think it holds up better than most of Ultimate's old Spectrum games, and I've enjoyed it enough to play through it a good half dozen times. It's complex enough to feel engaging while being simple enough that it doesn't get bogged down by hardware limitations or strange design choices, and having a defined goal helps motivate you to keep playing until you see the ending. After Attic Attack, Ultimate kept going with maze exploring games, with them sort of becoming a hallmark of the company for a while. Their next release after Attic Attack was a similar maze game, Saber Wolf. Saber Wolf is another old Ultimate game people may be familiar with, as it spawned a briefly running franchise and was even brought back on the Game Boy Advance in 2004. In Saber Wolf, you play the part of Saber Man, searching through a large jungle for the four pieces of the wolf amulet which will unlock the entrance to the underworld. In terms of gameplay, I found Saber Wolf to be a bit of a step down in terms of complexity from Attic Attack, with the inventory system completely removed and collectible items serving solely as power-ups, points, or game progression. The environment is dramatically more detailed, but I honestly think it's too detailed, as everything just kind of starts to look like a jumbled mess of colors, and the points where walls begin and end get hard to recognize. Even with a map, I struggle to navigate Saber Wolf because the environment is just so busy and repetitive. For enemies, the game has basic monsters that spawn randomly which can easily be defeated with your saber. There are also large, invulnerable enemies that patrol specific areas of the map. 
Most of these larger enemies can be turned around in their tracks by hitting them with your saber. The eponymous wolf, however, can only be fled from as it shrugs off any attack with no reaction. In addition to all of these, if you spend too long in a single room, it will spontaneously combust and invincible flames will start to spawn. Saber Wolf also features temporary power-ups in the form of orchids which bloom in random colors all around the map. All four of the colored orchids grant temporary invulnerability. In addition to that, the blue one increases your movement speed, the red one decreases your movement speed, the pink one inverts your controls, and the yellow one stuns you. Aside from that last one, there's little reason not to pick these up since invulnerability as an upside absolutely trumps any potential downside. There's also a white orchid which negates any active effect from a colored orchid. And that's really all there is to Saberwolf. The amulet pieces are randomly distributed among clearings found throughout the jungle, and once you find all four, you go to the center of the map and the game is over. There's just not a whole lot to this game, especially if you play it after Attic Attack. I was honestly a good bit disappointed by Saberwolf when I played through all these games for the first time, because it just wasn't as interesting to me as the game that came immediately before it. And I was especially disappointed after getting hyped up by this incredible features list found in the game manual. The game's got everything. It's got Saberman, realistic fighting, wolves, hippos, rhinos, yellow sickness orchids, blue super high energy orchids, three-dimensional scenarios, supplies, combat button, explosions, continuous balls, more supplies, materializations. It is quite a fully featured list. Saberwolf also starts a bit of a company tradition with its ending directly teasing and name dropping a sequel. Upon completing the game, an ending screen appears. The next adventures of Saberman will be continued in the Underworld. And Underworld is the very next game they released, in fact. Much like the two games preceding it, Underworld is a game focused on exploring a large maze. Unlike Attic Attack and Saberwolf, however, Underworld is a side-scrolling game. Oh, dude! This game has a chest of drawers in it! I've been looking for one of these! Underworld once again stars Saberman, and takes place immediately after the ending of Saberwolf. Having found your way into the Underworld, you must now find and defeat the three Underworld Guardians, and then escape through one of the exits at the top of the map. Each Guardian is weak to a specific weapon, which spawn in a randomly selected location from a short list of potential rooms. The Guardians themselves always appear in the same spots every time. In this game, Saberman cannot be killed by enemies. You can only die by falling from a great enough height. Instead of taking damage from enemies, you bounce off them, flying around the room like a pinball with no control over your trajectory, usually ending up at the bottom of a pit. You'll also bounce around this way if you jump against a wall or object. Saberman has lost his saber somehow, but you start the game next to a slingshot that sprays bullets in front of you aimlessly, which can take out regular enemies you'll find around the game. There's also a knife, a bow, and a torch. These are all functionally identical to the slingshot, but each one can be used to defeat a specific underworld guardian, not unlike the special enemies from Attic Attack who all had specific weaknesses. The main gameplay of Underworld is exploration of the underworld through platforming up and down vertical shafts. From the top of a shaft, you can hook onto the ceiling and rappel down to the bottom, which is safer than platforming while also leaving you an easier climb back up. As you explore, you'll find the Guardians, who are more like doors than enemies, standing completely still and serving no purpose other than to block your progress forward if you don't have the correct weapon. Each defeated Guardian opens up another chunk of the map to explore, with the third one finally giving you access to the topmost portion of the map with the three exits. Upon starting Underworld, the first thing you'll notice is that it's complete nonsense and it sucks. The premise and gameplay are very simple, and exploring the caves honestly is pretty fun. The platforming controls, however, are stiff and clunky. If you walk too close to a ledge while lining up a jump, Saberman jumps down off the platform automatically. The way you bounce around without control whenever you bump into anything is incredibly frustrating, and like all of Ultimate's games, there's just a lot of enemy spam creating even more obstacles to send you flying. There's also these birds that just pick you up and carry you around for as long as they please before dropping you, usually into a hole, which are some of the most obnoxious enemies I've ever seen in any video game. You can struggle against them to impede their flight, but it won't make them drop you any faster. The map itself is utterly gigantic, but the weapons and guardians are all located in the top half. The bottom 50% of the map is completely superfluous and exists only for you to get lost in. And you will get lost in it if you're exploring on your own. The game is incredibly difficult and frustrating, and when you first start playing it, it often feels more like the game is the one playing, with how much it takes control away and bounces your character all around the screen. All that being said, I actually really like this game a lot, under the right circumstances. Rare Replay includes this game, and it offers a few very useful cheat codes for it. 
All the retro games in Rare Replay include an infinite lives cheat and rewind feature, but Underworld specifically includes a cheat that stops all basic enemies from spawning entirely. These cheats are actually very useful for creating a safe environment to learn the game in. In my first playthrough of Underworld, I gave myself infinite lives and disabled enemies. Without needing to worry about shooting down enemies before they pushed me off the platform I was on, I was able to learn the stiff and awkward controls much more easily. Once I got used to controlling the game, I re-enabled enemies, and now I genuinely think it's really fun. If you turn on infinite lives and otherwise don't use any cheats, it kind of feels like a getting over it style rage game, where the controls are awkward and you keep falling down and losing progress, but finally getting to the top of the cliff you're scaling just feels so good. Of course, if you have to cheat to enjoy a game, that probably means the game itself isn't that great. But if you put yourself into the context of being a British 10-year-old in 1984, there's not a lot else to do with your time. You probably get one or two new games per year, if that, so the prospect of playing a frustrating game over and over until you get good at it was much less repulsive, since the only other thing you've got is that copy of Attic Attack you've beaten six times already. And of course, for as long as games have existed, cheating has as well. Infinite Lives cheats enabled a lot of kids to beat these old Ultimate games back in the day. Even professional game reviewers would mention using them sometimes. Once I learned how to control it properly, Underworld quickly became my favorite maze explorer from Ultimate. There was plenty of fun to be had in Attic Attack and Saberwolf, but Underworld is the only one of the three that made me feel a genuine sense of satisfaction when I overcame it. Underworld is like a culmination of everything we've seen so far, with the 2D perspective and nonsense difficulty from the Jetman games, the inventory system from Attic Attack, and the graphical fidelity and polish of Saberwolf. And just like Saberwolf, it ends with a sequel hook. There are three different exits to the Underworld, and each one tells you to play a different game. Depending on where you escaped, your next journey will either be Night Lore, Pentagram, or Mire Mare. Night Lore is another game featured in Rare Replay. Pentagram is not in Rare Replay, but we'll be taking a look at it as well once we get there. And as for Mire Mare, well, we'll talk about Mire Mare later. The next game Ultimate released after Underworld was Night Lore, and it was an absolute revolution. During the development of their past few titles, Ultimate was working on an all-new in-house engine for their games which would prove to shake up the entire platform. Filmation. Filmation was an engine that allowed Ultimate to create 3D flip-screen environments with beautifully detailed graphics and an at-the-time unprecedented level of freedom for the player. Night Lore is not the first isometric game by any means, but its level of complexity and detail far overshadow the isometric games that came before. Night Lore and Filmation are often credited as playing a significant part in the further adoption of isometric perspectives in the games industry as a whole, as after Night Lore released to great critical acclaim, other Spectrum developers started to copy the style extensively for years to come. Damn near every list of the best ZX Spectrum games of all time places Night Lore in a high position. It's a truly incredible feat of engineering for its time, and it is undeniably impressive. And I hate it. I hate this game so much. And the worst part is that I would have loved it if the Rare Replay version made just one change. But I'm getting ahead of myself, I haven't even told you what kind of game this is. Night Lore is another entry in the Saberman series, and it features a level of complexity beyond anything we've seen so far. In this game, Saberman has been afflicted with a werewolf's curse, and has 40 days and 40 nights to cure it before it becomes permanent. You have to explore Castle Nightlore for various magical charms and place a total of 14 of them into a cauldron in the center room, in an order specified by the cauldron itself upon entering the room. The charms appear in specific locations and are partially randomized upon starting the game. To navigate the castle, you have to solve simple puzzles and complete platforming challenges. Some objects can be pushed around and used as stairs, and in a pinch you can drop whatever charms you're carrying to use as footholds as well. The rooms have both stationary and moving obstacles as well as enemies with their own unique movement patterns. Some enemies will even push items around just like you can. There's also a day-night cycle, with Saberman turning into a werewolf every night. Enemy behaviors sometimes change based on what form you're in, but for the most part it doesn't really affect much aside from stopping you in your tracks while you transform, while all the enemies and obstacles continue to move. After 40 days and 40 nights pass, it's an immediate game over. As you can see, Night Lore is a dramatic step up in mechanical and visual complexity. The game is unfortunately too complex for its own good, however, because it chokes the spectrum to death every time you enter a room with any moving parts. This was a criticism of the game at the time, but back then, slowdown was just kind of a fact of all video games, so it was much easier to overlook. 
Going back to it in the modern day though, Night Lore Slowdown is a step beyond most retro games I've played, and I've played a lot. Night Lore often feels like one of those dreams where you desperately need to get somewhere as quickly as possible, but no matter how hard you run, you just aren't moving. It's maddening. I can forgive a lot in old games. I'm old and I'm slow too, but Night Lore is just too slow. And the reason it's so hard for me to overlook is because I can tell I would absolutely love this game if it ran at full speed, and I played it for the first time on an Xbox One. I'm gonna give Microsoft the benefit of the doubt and assume an Xbox One can run a ZX Spectrum game from 1984 at full speed, and it is likely emulating slowdown for accuracy. This is all fine and good, but I think Night Lore would have been tremendously improved by an option to disable emulated slowdown, if feasible. I'm not gonna pretend to know how easy or difficult that would be to include though, as I have no idea how Spectrum games were coded. This is sadly an issue with the Filmation engine in general. Filmation games slow down dramatically the more moving sprites are on screen at a time, often to the point of near unplayability. It was a revolutionary game engine for sure, and the games they made with it are extremely interesting, engaging, and beautiful, but they're so hard to go back to in the era of smooth frame rates. Night Lore is a great game that I just hate to play. But after an eternity of trudging through waist-high molasses, you finally gather all 14 charms required for the antidote and free Saberman from his curse. And you get a nice little end screen for your efforts. Go forth to Mire The next game they released is not Mire Mare, however. It's Alien 8. Alien 8 is another filmation game much like Night Lore, starring a little robot named Alien 8. Alien 8 is in charge of maintaining a spaceship which contains the cryogenically frozen citizens of a dead planet, protecting them until the ship reaches its destination and the cryonauts can be unfrozen. Unfortunately, while nearing its destination, the ship is attacked and boarded by aliens, and the life support system is deactivated. Alien 8 is now tasked with collecting the scattered components of the life support system and plugging them back in where they belong. The game is basically night lore, but instead of collecting charms and returning them to a single room in order, you instead need to find both the missing parts and the socket they plug into, in any order you please. There's sadly very little for me to say about Alien 8. I think in a lot of ways it's an improvement over night lore in terms of environment design and puzzles, but it still has all the issues Filmation brings with it, and at the end of the day, it's essentially just night lore too. Filmation was a truly revolutionary game engine that provided a level of complexity and freedom in its environments that were mostly unheard of at the time. But the complexity came at a price, and every game developed for it struggled to run at a consistent speed. But thankfully, Ultimate has already been working on a solution to these problems. Following up the success of Night Lore and Alien 8, Ultimate released Nightshade, another isometric title which used their new Filmation 2 engine. Some things you'll immediately notice when playing a Filmation 2 title are the reduced size of the play area, the significant reduction in environmental complexity, and the absence of objects that you can interact with. These changes dramatically improve the framerate problems that plague Filmation 1 titles, though Filmation 2 games are admittedly quite a bit simpler in their scope, likely by necessity. The flip screen environments from Night Lore and Alien 8 are also absent, replaced by a large, continuous scrolling area. Nightshade takes place in the remains of a village overrun by plague and now inhabited by ghouls and monsters. Rather than the slower-paced, puzzle-focused gameplay of Night Lore and Alien 8, Nightshade is more of an action game with a focus on taking out enemies by shooting at them, with a complex ammunition system where you collect various antibodies which all have different effects on different monsters. The main objective of the game is to collect four magical items hidden randomly around the village and to use them to defeat the four boss monsters wandering around the map. And this is starting to sound a bit familiar, isn't it? This is the point where Ultimate's releases kind of start to feel very similar to me. Alien 8 is essentially a carbon copy of Night Lore, and while Nightshade mixes up the gameplay focus and introduced an entirely new game engine, it still feels kind of uninspired compared to their earliest titles. Playing through their early catalog, every game feels completely new and unique, but once we hit Night Lore, it's all isometric action and adventure games in which you need to go collect some trinkets. My understanding from reading game reviews is that this was also a building sentiment at the time, and it's not helped much by their next release, Gunfright. Gunfright is another Filmation 2 title, and unlike Nightshade, it's available on Rare Replay if you want to try it yourself. Gunfright takes place in an old western town, and you play as the sheriff. The aim of the game is to track down wanted outlaws to defeat them and collect their bounties. 
Just like in Nightshade, the game's UI takes up a hilarious amount of screen space, keeping you informed of your target, lives, bullets, money, and the current state of the economy. And you need this because the economy is in an absolutely wild state of flux, with the costs of basic necessities like bullets and horses randomly spiking to obscene rates, much like modern day America. The shooting gameplay of Nightshade is simplified to an ordinary gun and bullets. Your weapon holds six shots, and once you've emptied them, you immediately reload and pay the current going rate for ammo. A new feature in Gunfright is the ability to mount a horse, which also costs a fee, but dramatically increases your movement speed for a short time. In addition to these costs, if you accidentally kill a civilian, you'll have to pay a fine. Bumping into someone will instantly kill both of you for some reason, while shooting them only kills them. Both offenses charge the same fine, so the punishment for shooting someone is notably more lenient than bumping into them. Aside from the main isometric shooting gameplay, Gunfight also has a completely new secondary gameplay mode, First Person Shooting. At the very start of the game, you'll play a short FPS minigame where you shoot bags of money to determine your starting funds, and after that, anytime you hit an outlaw, you'll be put into a brief FPS section where you have to shoot them before they shoot you. And they do shoot you very quickly. There are a total of 20 outlaws to hunt down, all with silly names like Rumpo Kid and Bronco Colorado and, uh... Ooh, ooh. Moving on from that, once you've found all of them, the game just pulls old targets back up for you to go for until you run out of lives. Gunfright plays well and stays at a fairly consistent speed outside of moments when a lot of characters are on screen at once, but it's honestly kind of boring? The increased simplicity of Nightshade and Gunfright are surely an attempt to address the slowdown that plagued Nightlore and Alien 8, but they feel like they're missing something. Despite being a technical advancement, they feel like a step back from the previous games, while also not doing enough to distinguish themselves from the rest of Ultimate's rapidly growing catalog of isometric games. I see why they chose Gunfright to include in Rare Replay, as it's definitely the more accessible of the two Filmation 2 titles. It still feels very similar to their other isometric releases, but it does try to mix things up a bit while keeping its scope simpler than games like Nightlore. Gunfright is also a good bookend for their Spectrum releases, as it's the last game Ultimate released before a certain controversial development. In 1985, the Stamper Brothers sold a minority stake in Ultimate Play the Game to the publisher US Gold. US Gold continued to produce and release games for the ZX Spectrum under the Ultimate Play the Game label, but you can tell they're not real Ultimate games. With the exception of one. Due to Ultimate's general veil of secrecy and their tendency to not include any credits at all, not even a programmer name on the insert in the box, there's one game in the Ultimate catalog with an uncertain development history, and that game is Pentagram. Pentagram was released in 1986 after the partial sale to US Gold. The Stamper Brothers have also referred to Gunfright as the last Spectrum game that they worked on together. However, they have also stated that their games didn't always release in the order they were developed in, with a specific example being a claim that Night Lore was finished before Saberwolf, but they held it back because of how primitive it would make Saberwolf and Underworld look by comparison. Pentagram was definitely conceived by actual Ultimate staff, since it's mentioned in the ending of Underworld. And it also uses the older Filmation 1 engine rather than Filmation 2, so it may very well have been in development for quite some time. After playing the game, as well as the definite US Gold games, I personally believe Pentagram was primarily made by Ultimate, perhaps being finished by US Gold. But there's unfortunately no way to know for certain exactly who worked on it and in what capacity. Even more unfortunate is that it's a Filmation 1 game. Just like Nightlore and Alien 8, Pentagram is slow. In this game, Saberman has become a wizard for some reason and is searching a forest for the scattered pieces of the Pentagram, which must be bathed in the waters of a magic well. New to Pentagram is the ability to shoot magic projectiles. In Nightlore and Alien 8, you can only avoid enemies, but in Pentagram, you can defend yourself and even use your magic to push objects around for puzzle solving. And there's nothing else to say about Pentagram, honestly. If you've seen one Filmation game, you've kind of seen them all. As I played through Pentagram, I couldn't help but think, haven't I played this already? And after looking up reviews of the title from 1986, it seems like I'm not the only person who felt that way. It's another night lore, and that's great if all you want is another night lore. And of course, just like every other Saberman game, completing Pentagram once again teases a future release. Mayermare. After Pentagram, we're truly in the US Gold era of Ultimate Play the Game. While Pentagram's authorship is disputed, the next three games we're discussing were 100% definitely from US Gold, and it really shows. 
I'll briefly go over these, but they aren't truly games from Ultimate, so I'm not going to go into great detail. First off, also in 1986, US Gold put out Cyber Run. Cyber Run is a 2D shooting game where the objective is to explore the surface and caverns of a planet collecting spacecraft parts and mining ore. It uses a thruster style of control like Jetpack and Lunar Jetman rather than simply having full 2D movement. It's fine, but it feels like a big step backwards, like it could have come out right after Lunar Jetman. Following up in 1987 was Bubbler. Bubbler is a game similar to Atari's Marble Madness, but if it wasn't very good. Your objective is to move your sphere around the map to collect corks, and then plug up the enemy spawners scattered around. Honestly, it's not really all that much like Marble Madness at all, aside from inexplicably being a ball and rolling around the environment. I could not get into this game at all. And finally, also in 1987, we have our final game, Martianoids. In Martianoids, you're a program defending a computer system from alien attack, I think? The game area is a 3x3 grid of rooms, and various rooms will come under attack and you need to navigate to them to defend them. It's not a very engaging game. I gave it a good try, but the game is just so boring, I couldn't push myself to play enough to learn how to play it well. And that's it, really. After an incredibly successful time developing for the ZX Spectrum, Ultimate's releases were taken over by another studio and the games just got worse and worse. A lot of Ultimate's games are pretty hard to go back to in the modern day, but if you look past their rough edges, you can see a lot of genuinely stellar imagination and creativity that's just absent from the US Gold releases. It was truly an end of an era. Wait a minute! What happened to Meyer Mayer? Unfortunately, if you go looking for Meyer Mayer, you'll be disappointed because the game doesn't exist. It never came out. Three separate games of theirs all tell you to look for Meyer Mare, and it was never released, not even by US Gold. According to former Rare employee Trevor Atwood via a Retro Gamer article in their September 2012 issue, some of the game design and artwork for Meyer Mare had been completed, but no actual coding for the game was ever done. I'm a 90s kid. When I beat Banjo-Kazooie and saw the teaser for Banjo-Tooie, I lost my mind with excitement. I was wondering about what Stop and Swap was and how it would work every day. We're jumping forward quite a bit, but if you're familiar with that story, you know Stop and Swap was a scrapped feature Rare wanted to implement in several of their games, but they were unable to due to technical limitations. When I read about Meyer Mare, I felt a kinship with these 80s kids who played every game Ultimate would release, excitedly waiting for the Saberman game that would never come to be. Rare is well known for being very quiet developers, rarely speaking about their games before or after their release, even all the way back to when they were Ultimate Play the Game. But they love to put these little teasers in their games for future ones. They like to make their games connect to each other, stimulating the imagination of the kids who play them, wondering about these promised experiences and what they'll be like and when they'll happen. I love this about Rare. They have this mystique about them that spawned numerous long-lasting gaming rumors and mysteries, and their silence means their fans never quite get the answers they want. Fan speculation about what could have been is absolutely rampant all over their history. From Meyer Mare to Stop and Swap, Rare somehow manages to hold all their secrets close to their chest while also saying just enough to create these enduring stories. It's a really unique thing that you don't see much with other game developers, and it's one of the reasons I fell in love with them in their games when I was a kid. How does Saberman's journey end? What awaits him in Meyer Mare? Unfortunately, it seems we'll never truly know. And with that, we've now explored all of Ultimate ZX Spectrum releases, including the ones that weren't actually theirs. I would say if you're into retro games like I am, it's definitely worth picking up Rare Replay and trying out the seven titles they ported to it. Some aged worse than others, but if I put myself in that time period and think about what came before these games, they're truly incredible pieces of work. Ambitious sometimes to a fault, always trying to innovate in new and exciting ways. Everything I've seen from people who were there to experience them when they were new seem to agree, Ultimate Play the Game truly was a rare company. But that's just the start of their story. Behind the scenes, while working on their last few Spectrum games, Tim and Chris Stamper had started another company they intended to use for development on Japanese game systems. Rare Designs on the Future. In the next video, we're going to talk about this company and their releases for the Nintendo Entertainment System, so make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. And that brings the first episode of Rare Retrospective to a close. 
What did you think of these games? Had you even heard of Ultimate Play the Game before now? I would love to read your thoughts down in the comments. Thank you all for watching. Until next time, this is Ashley, crafting Meyermare theories and signing out.